All right. Good morning, everybody. Where be the chat? Uh, don't all speak at once. Okay, so the quarantine beard is coming in nicely. Yeah, actually, you've got a little bit of uh, white or gray in there too. Makes me look more mature. <laughs> okay, so plan of the day, or at least for the next fifty minutes or so. Ask me any questions you want either on the chat or uh, by audio. Because it is exam on Friday, the last one. This is it, chaps and chapettes. Very sad, actually. I could start singing if you want. My wife watched a sing-along Disney thing yesterday. I can try some some tunes from that. What was it? <laughs> oh, all the greatest hits. Uh, Under the Sea is actually my favourite. I can't remember all the words, unfortunately. But <laughs> <laughs> well, fortunately, you know, it kind of depends on your perspective. Go on, ladies and gents. So has nobody asked a question yet, like on chat or anything? Nope. Nobody's, up, nobody's said anything other than Paul to um, compliment me on my beard, which is rather have, nice. Have you heard of uh, this gateway to hell in Turkmenistan? It's like a, a, a methane seep that the uh, Russians discovered, and they accidentally drilled into it, and like it caved in on itself, so they just lit it on fire. And I assume they lit it on fire to keep the methane from seeping out of the atmosphere instead of like CO2 and water. Okay, but uh, apparently hell. some scientist has like recently like gone through training with like stunt guys in a fire suit to go into the pit to try and culture microbes that are living in there to see wow. if they can withstand the environment. Yeah, have you heard of this or no? No, no, it's totally new. I've uh, just bringing it up. Yeah, look for... up Gateway to Hell Turkmenistan. I found it the other day. How did you find that? My wife tossed it to me. Okay, that's cool. <laughs> yeah. She was uh, reading on Pinterest and so I was like, what the? Wow. That looks uh, suitably hellish. That's for sure. If you can see the, pic <laughs> the picture there. Oh, did you know that there's, um, not entirely related, but uh in central pa pennsylvania not far from where we used to live whereabouts was it it's somewhere in pennsylvania there's actually a, a long running underground uh coal fire okay that's been going on for huh. oh i don't know 20 30 years something like that underneath the town um i don't know i uh, don't know if it was involved in uh related to coal mining in the region of which there's quite a bit uh but basically it was uh, i think it might have been actually a natural uh uh seam and uh it was underneath the town and so you, i think there's like three people still living in that town which is kind of crazy because some parts of the town you can't walk there because the ground's too hot and it's just been you know con like a slow burning fire that's been going on for uh decades i'll have to see if i can find find where that Not to is mention all the emissions coming out yeah yeah but there's like some old like grouchy granddads and grandmas are like yeah fuck this i'm not gonna move and so they're just still in their houses like in you know places around this town which i just think is crazy ah i got a question so thank you for that jimmy that is that's pretty cool i have to do some more reading up on that no problem all right, so what are the biases of transit photometry in terms of planet size and orbital period? So this is a question from Pedro. Pedro, based on what you know about Maybe. transit Maybe. photometry, what are you, what is it based on? 
how does it work? Hopefully, I'm not going to scare off other people from asking well, questions now. But well, I know we find the large gas giants. But, and but what's the underlying looking. principle of transit photometry? How how does the actual technique work? Well, I mean, so what are we looking transit for? Transit photometry. We're looking for you know, Earth-sized planets in that. Well, that's, I mean, Let me see here. <laughs> we're, we're, looking for, we're looking for exoplanets, right? I mean, that's, that's the overall uh, right. aim, and we're hoping to find kind of rocky Earth-sized ones because those might be habitable um, right. or have, it, have life. Uh, but what, how do we actually detect any planet by transit photometry? What's the, the basic principle that's being used? If you think about kind of part, it's in, it's in the name as well. So it's transit and light. What what are we what are we I looking mean, at? Second, I mean, we're like we're looking for. I mean, we're using photometry pictures, and we're right. using uh, you know all things, all types of um, technology that is able to so see if where there's you know radio yeah. waves light uh we're not so much interested in radio waves not at that point we're, we're interested in light so you know the a star in the system gives out light right our light. sun gives out light yeah so uh what could block that light partially at least So we could have, you know, a giant, I don't know, uh, spaghetti monster, right, flowing around in space or a teapot or something. Planet. A planet, right? And so if you have a, a star system like this, kind of with a star here, and you have planets orbiting around that, if you're looking at it like I am kind of directly like so, so I'm, I'm edge on to the, the ecliptic, you know, the plane in which the planets orbit, What's going to happen when we've got this, out, you know, a light output, right? And a planet moves in front of that star. What's going to happen to the light output of that star? Well, it's going to cast, I think it's going to block it. Right. That's exactly the idea. So it's going to block it, but it's also going to, uh, What's going to affect how much light is blocked by that planet? So we're going to see a dip in the output. It's going to be a little dig, like so as that planet passes in front of that star. How is what characteristics of that planet is going to affect that drop? How big that drop is? Like the size of the planet and the distance to their sun. Right. So if you have you know, like a, a tiny planet like this big, right, that passes in front, you're going to get a little blip, right? If you have a big planet like so that passes in front, you'll get a much more noticeable blip, right? So the bigger the planet is, the bigger the drop in light output. Now, <coughs> that's, uh, you know, pretty obvious, right, in, in many ways, right? The bigger the object blocking the light, the more light that's going to get blocked. Um, but the terms of orbital period, essentially that's how close that planet orbits to that star, right? So if you have a planet doing this, right, you're going to see a drip, drip, drip like that little dip periodically, right? As that planet orbits in front or transits in front of that star. Now, if you have the same size star, let's put it out here, right? It's going to be doing this. And then we get another one. You know, it, you're going to get a, not only are you going to get a very much less frequent blip, you're also going to get, a, yeah, I mean, you're going to get a less frequent blip, right? So you're less likely to see that blip. 
So the further away that that planet is, even though, I mean, technically it could block a little bit more of that light. I don't think that's too big of an issue. Um, essentially, the periodicity, right? How how often that happens is much much less frequent, and so you're more likely to find big planets close to the stars using transit photometry, generally speaking. So if you look at, uh, let's see if I've actually okay. opened. Pardon me. So this is a, um, I mean, kind of planet masses. Do we have planet size? Oh, planet radius, here we go. Um, uh, these yellow dots, as far as I can remember, are um, exoplanets detected by transit photometry. And you can see a similar thing on the other one. I'll go back to that in a second. But essentially, almost all the planets you find are large, well, large-ish, you know, equivalent to um, super-Earths, basically, kind of between Earth and, and Neptune, and close to uh, their star. And if you look at it this way, come on, uh, that gives you it by mass, which is kind of a proxy for size. It's not a very good one. Um, and so looking at it this way, um, they're all over to the left, right? They've got, all got really short uh, orbital periods and they have, uh, they're generally much larger planets than, than ours. Uh, Earth would be down, um, it's kind of about down here, right near the bottom of that graph, right? So the bias is towards large planets because of the um, the degree of drop in output and also uh, shorter orbital periods because it's a lot easier to detect something that occurs frequently than something that occurs regular, uh, rarely. How, how long does it take? Now let's just, hang on a second, I've got to check something out. Now let's look at Saturn. All right, so for example, uh, if an alien were observing our solar system by transit photometry, it would have to wait, it would take at least 60 years to confirm the presence of, or even get a hint at, the presence of Saturn. Right, because even though it's a gas giant, it's big, right? And um, I'm guessing Jupiter's probably about half that time, given it has about half the orbital radius. Uh, it would take an astonishingly long amount of time to detect that planet. And we haven't even been doing this for 29 years, right? You know, so any, any of those kind of much larger uh, star systems, you know, with even with gas giants further out, you're just not going to see those planets because we just haven't been looking long enough, right, to be able to see them, that kind of frequency. Right. Um, so, um, second part of your question, yes, rocky planets have been found, um, and kind of near-Earth planets have been found too, uh, but they're much less frequent. So there, there are, I think there's a handy chart in, where is it, in here somewhere. How are they determining the mass of a planet using this? Are they going with like distance from the sun to the elements that will get drawn into in the proto star um, formation? Not so much. They're the actually, radius. Do you have pet yeah. birds by any chance, Jimmy? Or are you just outside? No, I'm outside working out. Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> that sounds very, very pleasant, actually. Uh, come back to your, set, your question in a second, Jimmy. Uh, so just finishing up um, Pedro's question, even though these, these numbers are a little bit out of date, you can basically see that uh, about 10% of the planets are terrestrial. So um, the vast majority, like two thirds or more, have been uh, large gas or ice giants. And that's really because of those biases. It's not because we think there are more gas or ice giants out there. It's simply that those are the ones that we're more likely to find. So that we found more of them. Um, did that help? So there, there is a 
it's tough, there is a chance to find small rocky planets. Using oh yeah, yeah, most definitely. Um, technology. And again, uh, yeah, it's just harder. Really, that's all all you can you can say because they're smaller, right? So they're less Great. likely to be detected. So I was just only asking because I was going through my quiz answers and that was one of the that was the only part of that collection of answers that I got wrong okay um so I was just curious about it yeah yeah I mean it's not that we won't find them it's just that we're much less likely to that's all um but again on the flip side <laughs> I mean, it's, it's, so can it's I get credit for that answer that was marked wrong? <laughs> uh, I don't know, Pedro. I'd have to go back and look at the quiz and how it was written. Um, I'll do that after. Was on your day. Okay, awesome. Okay. Uh, so, Jimmy, um, how do we determine mass? So that's actually typically done via the. Um, uh, radial velocity method. Actually, there's a couple of different uh, ways of doing it. One is so basically from the from the periodicity of the the dip, you know how frequently it happens, and the depth of the dip, and also you know kind of the duration of the dip. You can get an idea about how um, the orbital period and the radius of the planet, right? Essentially. And then from that, you can look at the uh, radial velocity, so the, the Doppler shift that that planet exerts on its star. And uh, that will get you, based on how much oh, yeah. the planet's moving the star, that will give you its mass. And also on top of that, if you have... Um, okay, yeah, that totally makes sense. Yeah, so that's why for some planets we can't do that. Um, because I think that something about some that are too far away that radial velocity uh, technique is a lot less sensitive. I don't I don't actually know why. Um, but I remember reading for some of the exoplanets that have been discovered that are out, you know, a thousand to three thousand light years away. It's really hard to determine mass. Um, uh, the other way that you can do it as well is. If you have more than one planet, um, essentially the mass of one planet affects the orbital period ever so slightly uh, of any other planets in the system. And so basically when two planets are in conjunction, you know, they're, they're both at the same kind of point in their orbit relative to the star, uh, one planet will slow the other one down ever so slightly. It acts like a gravitational break almost and then until the planet then goes past it and then it speeds up a little bit more and so essentially you have those the time of orbit of a planet or the radial yeah i guess the radial velocity of a planet orbiting a star is not constant if there are other planets there and so the various uh the degree to which that speed varies based on other planets can be used to determine the mass of those planets as well so it's essentially, you know, the gravitational that makes sense. effect. So on that note, go ahead. No, no, that was, that was pretty much it. Does that happen to the moons around Jupiter? Like when they kind of line up or whatever, or when one passes the other one, does it slow it down also? It does. Um, but I'm just wondering, I don't know. Yeah, because, okay. <laughs> because they're in the system, it's a stable one, right? So, so essentially, um, that gravitational drag is part of how uh, planets can have a tendency to migrate inwards towards a star, right? It's essentially kind of like the, uh, like a protoplanetary disk, you know, stuff is kind of condensing towards a massive object, pardon me. But the presence of massive planets further out kind of acts as a counterbalance. So that's why um, the TRAPPIST-1 system is so stable is because even though there are kind of, you know, the planets are tugging each other, uh, which basically would prompt that planet to migrate inwards, 
at the same time they get pulled back outwards a little bit by other planets that are uh, in resonance with them and so that's what kind of creates that kind of semi-stable uh, solar system and actually I'd, I'd have to read more into it to be honest because I, I know that the gas giants migrated into the solar system earlier on in our solar system's history um, and I can't quite remember what made them migrate back out again. Yeah, there's, there's something in there. I, I can remember reading about it. I just can't remember it well enough to explain it. Um, but yeah, so that's, that's kind of, that's also partly why uh, moons become tidally locked or actually planets as well, because the, um, that, gra that gravitational drag slows their rotation. And so, you know, essentially the moon is, is causing our rotation of the uh, Earth to slow down ever so, ever so slightly over time, just as we've caused the moon's rotation to stop so that it's, well, I mean, it's not stopped, it just rotates once for every orbit, so it's effectively uh, tidally locked. It's pretty crazy when you think about stuff on that kind of scale, that's for sure. Yeah, it's all like connected or intertwined. Mm -hmm. Physics. <laughs> yeah. It's fun to dabble in. Wouldn't want to do it for a career. Okay. Questions, questions, ladies and gents. Or we could just spend actually that's So for the Conan oh. the bacterium. You saved me. Okay, go on. <laughs> The Conan, the bacterium, you talked about how could this bacteria uh, evolve these traits with no uh, amounts of radiation on the planet like that? Uh -huh. Would an acceptable answer to be that Chiara, Chiara sent it from the future using the fifth dimension? <laughs> I don't think Chiara's if online. If she stuck it on a rock or a satellite, <laughs> then it would be exposed to the radiation. Oh, she and is then there. And it would evolve, and then awesome. it came. Totally uh, did that. I created Conan the Vacuum. Kiara is the creator of all life on Earth, actually. She's just a very ancient being that's hung around studying astrobiology for fun. She you knows all the stuff. I don't believe that. I think my brain is like from the future. Like, I'm not even lying. <laughs> <laughs> Kiara's over here with galaxy brain takes. Wonderful. Exactly. Well, uh, I don't want to tread on Kiara's ego or anything. Um, so it's pretty unlikely that, uh, yeah, sorry, Kiara. Um, traits like that would have evolved during interplanetary transit, you know, the whole panspermia thing. Um, but the big deal with uh, Conan and the bacterium is really that an awful lot of those extremophile traits are, they cross over. So they are, um, trying to think of, it's not convergent evolution, that's not the right term. Um, I don't know, I'm not really sure what the right term is to be honest. But essentially the, the ability to resist one extreme condition confers that ability to exist something else, uh, resist something else. Um, so particularly for um, desiccation or uh, high salinity, which essentially is kind of the same as desiccation in some ways, um, and radiation resistance and things like that, they all kind of go together. And so a lot of the, the means to protect against them are the same. And so really radiation resistance appears to be more of a kind of accidental benefit. Um, but there are also organisms- Because it developed the other skills that are so correct. strong and, and it just happens to be able to resist the radiation too. Yeah, yeah, so it's, actually, it's not 100% clear um, how exactly all of that could happen. But for example, um, if you think about halo files, right? So uh, extreme salt tolerant uh, organisms, typically they, you know, if you're gonna be somewhere really salty, you're gonna be somewhere very hot as well, that's subject to a lot of solar radiation, particularly elevation. There's a lot of those places in um, 
South America, for example, uh, in Chile, northern Chile, um, and the like. And so if you're kind of, uh, you have traits which are selected by your environment, which is a very salty one, almost certainly that environment has high levels of radiation at the same time because it's very high in altitude or it's very near to the equator or whatever, right? A lot of those uh, things go together. And so if you're, um, if the selection pressure is very strongly in favor of uh, things to resist high salinity or low uh, water availability, then almost certainly they're gonna be promoting or selecting for resistance to um, radiation. And for example, like even bacteriodopsin and, and photorhodopsin, they're also pigments. They actually play a role not just in the um, maintain an osmotic balance, but they also absorb uh, solar energy, right? So that it helps those organisms um, basically not get burnt up. Same as a lot of uh, keratinids, you know, a lot of the pigments in plants uh, that make plants the colors they are are not there to help with photosynthesis they help they're there to help uh, protect against uh, uv and and um, high rate not high radiation but high uv levels basically so it's kind of a coincident evolution i guess you know the there's a whole bunch of uh, uh, characteristics of that environment which select for similar things and then those things then allow that organism to live elsewhere in not analogous environments, but kind of protects against, you know, extreme levels of radiation, for example, which you'd rarely find. Um, so, yeah, it's, it's such a, it's a really interesting aspect of extreme files, to be honest. A lot of those, those things overlap, which actually makes the whole idea of panspermia pretty interesting too. Because if you have an organism that can resist, you know, low water, high salt, uh, high radiation, then you've got an organism which is pretty well prepared to travel across the vacuum of space. There you go. I watched Aliens with the kids last night. So. Are you taking notes, Kiara? <laughs> right. Wait, you watched <laughs> Aliens with your kids? Yeah, yeah, we're working through the Alien anthology now. So we did Alien uh night before last and aliens last night oh when i was a kid the second one gave me nightmares man. <laughs> the first one gave me nightmares man no the way first one of them is too horrifying. easy a colony worth uh-uh wrong no way dude that chest burst you're seeing is like stuff of nightmares <laughs> <laughs> yeah it was pretty awesome i love those films there particularly alien oh, no, is one of my favorites alien one and two are great mm -hmm. and then it's a steep decline, but they're one like the first two are fantastic. Yeah, I feel kind of obliged to watch the other ones, even though I know they're not anywhere near as good, just for the sake of completeness. I don't know. Completely I like understand that. All right, Kiara. Oh yeah, Kiara's taking notes. I'm gonna have to uh destroy this chat and go and like uh take away her, her notes from her home or something. Just so she doesn't get the idea to make a rocket in her backyard and send it to Europa. <laughs> I'm gonna colonize all the moons of Saturn and all the moons of Jupiter, and I'm gonna make it awesome. You can't do that. Man, secretly, Doctor Manhattan. Cow's <laughs> gonna be busy like scraping off skin cells or something from herself. Exactly. <laughs> I'm gonna make a clone. Yeah, that's right. All right, questions, questions. What else we got? I mean, we could just chat about sci-fi for forever, but I mean. is there like a way you could use the uh transit photometry to like extrapolate the chances of terrestrial planets in a system based off of like positioning of the frost line from the the uh gas giants 
Um, no, is the easy answer. Surely, answer. yeah, I mean, probably <laughs> not. But like, surely there isn't a pattern to how many planets are in a system. But like, no, there is. maybe. You know, well, like, is there anything that you could do to kind of figure that out? Or are we just kind of honestly just throwing, I mean, I know we're throwing darts in the dark and hoping right. for the best, but. Well, the thing, the problem with the exoplanet search is it basically completely blew up our own view of how solar systems form. And so uh, basically we shouldn't be finding any hot Jupiters. Right, all of those ice and gas giants that are very close to their stars, we shouldn't find them if our version of the solar system is the correct one, like how it forms, the whole presence of a frost line and the like. So uh, essentially it's shown us an awful lot about how much we don't know about solar system formation. And technically, you know, you shouldn't have gas giants, right, very close to a hot star. It shouldn't be possible. It shouldn't f form that way. So um, there's not much you can do by looking at a solar system to figure out, you know, uh, what the chance of life is there. I mean, there is, there is, and there isn't. I mean, there's lots of different factors that go into it, right? So obviously, the the habitable zone is is calculated kind of a priori from the temperature of the star. So the surface temperature, ours is like 5,800 Kelvin or so. And so based on that, you know that uh, a certain band, a certain distance from the star will have, water can be liquid, right, essentially. And that's just based on fairly uniform astrophysics. It's not really changed by whether there are you know what sort of planets are there or not you know it's uh kind of a almost invariant uh value really um and then figuring out whether uh there's a lot of stuff that goes into potential for life right obviously uh well there's i mean yeah i mean I don't, we don't really know to be honest right we don't have any other data points uh, one thing is that um, there's a big argument about red dwarfs in terms of them being uh, flare stars. So they're much less stable stars than ours is. And so there's arguments both one way and the other that, you know, more UV is bad, right? Because it's going to kill everything. It's going to sterilize those planets. And then other people say, well, you know, I mean, UV causes mutation and mutation is a source of all genetic novelty, right? So maybe that is a good thing for evolution. Um, there's not really any way of, of knowing uh, without finding evidence one way or another. Um, and to be honest, there's no reason why there couldn't be life on gas giants. You know, we have uh, quite an, not an abundance of life, but there are bacteria that live up in the uh, in the atmosphere, right? We don't have to have a solid uh, ground for things to live on or water for things to live in. They can actually live up in clouds. Uh, and there's not a whole ton of them, but there's there are bacteria that live up, you know, several miles high in our atmosphere. So technically, we could actually find org organisms living in gas giants as well. I don't, I mean doesn't have to be a rocky planet it's just kind of almost anthropomorphically that's what we look for because of our own experience that you know life is here under these particular conditions if we find these conditions elsewhere then we should find life maybe so yeah there's it's nothing really much you can look at in terms of uh solar system structure i guess um stability maybe you know, because if the solar system is in an unstable state, then there's uh, like a high likelihood of collisions between the planets or planetary migration, which can really screw up other aspects of that planet's, you know, characteristics. Um, but yeah, it's a crapshoot. It really is. 
so like not to be reductionist but basically we're just kind of going there's a planet out there that's it that's all we know cool like well yeah but the the with the advances in telescope power um particularly the what is it now the extremely large telescope uh, always always makes me laugh whenever i read that when when you discover that the very large teles the vlt actually stood for very large telescope i'm not used to science <laughs> acronyms being funny i'm used to them right. being like serious um but yeah with the the advance in uh resolving power of uh basically bigger telescopes right um and the the more and more powerful space telescopes that we have like the spitzer and then the james webb which is going up next year um we're going to be able to start looking at atmospheres and so we've done that for a few uh exoplanets um typically ones closer to us um but it's it's almost always in the infrared because that's where um uh, most most of the things that we're interested in such as methane uh carbon dioxide carbon monoxide i think and some other bits and pieces uh water vapor obviously that's the wavelengths that those uh those bonds absorb at so our ability to look at uh distant solar systems in the infrared is actually a very key to figuring out habitability and so once we're able to do that more, then we'll start getting a handle on not only is this a planet and it looks like it's got about the right mass and stuff like that, um, but also it has an atmosphere and it atm its atmosphere contains this. And are there essentially uh, chemical imbalances in that atmosphere, like oxygen and methane, for example, like we have here? Um, and so essentially the what you're kind of observing right now is the very beginning of that process of planet discovery right even though it's been going on for I don't know, like what was it 1992 was the first one so it's been going on for a little while but the the curve is kind of you know it's gone up only really in the last 10 years or so um and then the next stage is starting to characterize those planets more carefully because some of them i mean a lot of it's just kind of guessing you know based on mass and radius you can calculate density and if the density figures don't kind of match up with essentially a series of scenarios right you know if it has a very low density it's almost certainly a gas giant if it's uh, got a density of this and a radius of this it might be a rocky terrestrial planet and so on and so forth right but really that's just well yeah it kind of fits in this bin we'll stick it in this one uh, we don't have any direct proof of it having an atmosphere or oceans we're just making an educated guess and so with the next round of uh telescopes both on earth and in space we should be able to get a much better uh look at those planets and start narrowing it down so yeah it is, it is kind of needle in the haystack type job that's for sure hope that helped but yeah we, you're very much at the beginning so if you keep you know observing this over the next probably i'd say about 10 years maybe 20 years you'll you'll see a lot of exoplanets which are then characterized more completely and so you have a basically a better idea of whether they're they have suitable environments for what we think is life obviously we don't know if life is going to look like us it's just a an assumption So yeah, keep your eyes on it. It'll be fun. All right, questions, questions. So like, what's what's so wrong about <laughs> <laughs> sending bacteria, you know, to another, like, I guess to the moon or something to see how it, how it reacts because that's what i thought when i first said that i was thinking like oh if we send something there we can see like if it'll survive or not 
Right. Um, I'm not sure there's a big deal about Sentence and Loon. There'd probably be people that would object. Um, I mean, I don't know. I'm not really sure there's a big deal there, but um, the issue with sending microbes anywhere else is how do you know if you've discovered life, if you've brought some life with you? That's the issue. Well, I mean, that's, that's kind of the issue in terms of uh, astrobiology, in terms of uh, ecology. It's, well, you don't want to contaminate another environment. You know, you don't want to be the, the Spanish settlers in North and South America, essentially, bringing stuff with you that uh, white, white <laughs> That's tower. exactly what I was thinking. I just don't want to be the one. I mean, it happened, right? And and so there's that's basically like the two things. One is, you know, we're, we're intensely focused on being able to find life elsewhere. And so one of the the key requirements to do so is that you can be sure that anything that you discover is based on what you're finding, right? Not what you're bringing with you. And because these, you know, these uh, uh, probes and the like, it's not just going to be a one-off. Presumably, we'll be sending more and more over the next, I don't know, few hundred years to um, these different moons and planets. Uh, if you take if you contaminate the environment, then every subsequent mission is going to be like, well, is that from like Kentucky or uh, is that, you know, endogenous to Europa? Um, it would be a really hard question to ask. Uh, and then there's just the plain ethical thing of, you know, we shouldn't be contaminating foreign ecosystems if they are ecosystems um, with our life because that's wrong. So sorry for saying that you're wrong, Kiara, but you are. No, it makes sense. <laughs> yeah, much the same as, um, you know, when they were drilling into Lake Vostok uh, to see if there was life there. Now, obviously, they you want to take extreme care to make sure you don't introduce life from the surface because then that's going to confound any discoveries that you make, basically. Also going to you know, potentially screw up that environment. Uh, question from Ayla. Uh, the final is not explicitly cumulative. There you go, couching my words carefully. Um, it is based on the material that we've covered in the second half of the semester since spring break or extended spring break. Um, but just by the nature of learning the material in this course, there's almost certainly going to be stuff that you learn at the beginning of the course that will help you understand stuff that you're learning now, pardon me, or have learned in the last half of the course. So it's not, you're not going to be asked questions on information that you learned in the first half of the course, but some of that stuff that you learned in the first half, half of the course is kind of implicitly wrapped up in what you're learning in the second half of the course you know so so no it's not it's not that you have to go back and you know study all of that stuff that you learned you know months ago um but understanding that stuff that you learned months ago will make it easier to understand what you're learning or studying now kind of fairly standard thing to be honest did that help Ayla? Cool beans. So, I don't know. Same format. Same format. Yeah, 30 questions. Uh, I haven't written it you yet. Happen obviously. to recycle questions? What's that? Do you, you happen to recycle questions? Like use the same ones? Oh, it depends on how much I want to finish writing the exam, I guess. Um, <laughs> How sussy you're feeling. <laughs> yeah. um, generally, no. Um, from, if probably from quizzes, I'm guessing what you're wondering. Um, but mm -hmm. I'll almost certainly touch on the same topics that we've covered in quizzes. 
because essentially the reason why I covered them in quizzes is because I want you to understand them and so they're important and therefore I'm going to want to see if you do understand them so they'll be in the exam. No, so, yeah, so going, going back over prior quizzes is, is a good uh, thing to do. Also going over the study guide, which I know some of you are already doing, um, because I do use that to write the exam. Um, partly to remind myself of you know particular things that I want to ask you about, but also to make sure I spread the questions evenly uh, throughout the whole uh, subject material. So that's a valuable resource to use. And I've, I've tried couching it in terms of questions uh, to get you to think about that stuff rather than just statements. So it's really a, a means to study, right? It's not a, it's not a synopsis or a, a summary. It's a, it's a guide. Um, and also the exam will be available all uh, Friday from nine o'clock in the morning till midnight. So that if you have, or if anyone has issues with kind of scheduling from jobs and family commitments and stuff, uh, then you can take it whenever you want. But exactly the same format, yes. But with partial credit this time. How many movie questions are there going to be, though? <laughs> well, can we get like a twenty-five percent on that one? <laughs> I am mean, just buffing up on my movie trivia thanks to this uh, quarantine. So, as tempting as as it is, I mean, I actually thought, you know, what's what's the name of the colonial marine ship in Aliens? That was actually a question that went through my head last night. Oh, an alien? The Nostromo question. Isn't no. that alien? It, the, the, the the aliens, aliens is the USS Sulaco. Yes, that's it, Sulaco. Oh, the Sulaco, yeah. <laughs> yeah, tempting as that may be, though, I don't think it's very fair to, to students that are not sci-fi movie nerds. And so I, I, I'll, I'll restrict it to stuff that we've just covered in the... <laughs> in the PowerPoints and in the classes. My, my clan tag is literally the ultimate badasses from Hudson speech in the dropship. Oh, right. Yeah. <laughs> that didn't work out so well for him, did it? <laughs> Game over, man. Game over, man. Right. Um, question from Ayla. Yeah, if you have any questions between now and uh, Friday morning, um, just send them to me by email and I'll be more than happy to clarify them. Um, so yeah, it's... Uh, it's not we're not done now necessarily if you if you need uh, feedback or clarification on stuff um, and I will obviously answer them before Friday morning but I'll, I'll aim to do answer those emails within the day so you have uh, have time to kind of ruminate on them so yeah definitely no there's no if you want to ask questions just ask when answer instantly I might be on my bike or uh doing something else but i will i will answer as quickly as i can bill paxton speaking of alien killed by an alien a predator and a terminator fun fact oh, is that right <laughs> yeah that's true <laughs> didn't he die recently I seem to remember yeah he died no. a couple of years ago yeah no are you serious yeah man yeah, yeah that's bill paxton. sad great actor well i don't pay attention to anything like that that's crazy yeah, that's <laughs> yeah he was like the punk kid in the first terminator Yes, he is. Oh, just reading a question from Pedro. <laughs> Pedro, this is not a democracy. <laughs> but no, there, there won't be uh, movie questions on the final. Now, right. Actually, I, I used to do things like that for um, like bonus credit, like thinking I was helping students out and they, they just got so pissed off at me. So... No, Vivian, no extra credit. It's just the exam. Calm down. Um, and no Disney movies. No, if my wife was writing the, the exam, then, you know, Disney movies and Disney movie songs would be a, a big part of it. But that's not going to be part of it either. Just the material that we've learned. Sorry. Ah, so, so tempted to put a Bill Paxton quote in now, though. <laughs> Questions, 30. But technically we went over lanes. That's true. Ah. How many of you can remember what the 
uh, Sigourney Weaver's character is called. Gotcha. That's too easy. Yeah, I know that's really easy. What about her cat? Oh. That's <laughs> yeah. a great question. I can see it. <laughs> Jonesy. Jonesy. Yeah, or Jones, depending. Wasn't that the... Oh, yeah, no. Uh, final exam, uh, Robertson will be the same as before, 50 minutes. Uh, I might actually make it 55 minutes, just be kind. Unless you have accommodations with DSS. So yeah, it's, it's exactly the same as the midterm exam. Same amount of questions, ideally the same kind of uh, spread of questions. How about an hour? Okay, fine. Jesus, you're like my daughter, Robert. <laughs> hey, I want to have a hard bargain. Yeah, like, can I play on the computer on the Xbox? Yeah, forty-five minutes. Okay, how about an hour? Oh, yeah, sure. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Robert, you're a, you're a hard bargainer there. We should send you to the World Trade Organization or something. All right. Anybody got any questions? I'm sorry, sir. <laughs> That's okay. Anybody got any questions uh, about anything, actually? You can ask me questions about sci-fi films if you want. You can spend all day talking about those. I actually found one that I've got to go back and watch again called Pandorum. I don't know if anyone's uh, watched that. Um, yes, is that the one where those people wake up and like there's something on the ship that's like mutated, blah 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 blah. I don't yeah, know. like uh, they turned into cannibals or something like that. Yeah, like the ending is is kind of like oh wow, crazy. Well, I didn't actually finish watching all of it. I watched a bit of it with my wife, and she's just like, oh, this is so scary. And then we stopped watching. No, you got to finish it. Like it's the ending will blow your mind too. Yeah, like, I think what? I. I come across it in some of my, you know, uh, internet wanderings, looking up something else. Um, Sad. Yeah, I'll have, I'll have to add that. We also. Uh, I've been trying to remember what the name was, and I couldn't remember. Yeah, Pandorum. Also, need to watch. Um, we started the other day with one of my my old my youngest daughter, who's a real uh, horror and zombie fan, and and uh, she's twelve. And so we started watching The Train to Busan on Netflix. I don't know if you've seen that. No, nah, what is that about? Uh, it's about like a zombie, zomb oh, there you go, Isla's watched it. Uh, oh. A zombie outbreak in, in South Korea. It made me cry so much. It is such a good movie. Great. Yeah, yeah I really want to watch it. And they even have a zombie deer. How, how cool is that? Like this deer gets run over at the beginning of the film. And then after a while, it just kind of like twitches. And gets up and goes, ah, it's a deer, zombie deer. We're running a feed, zomb <laughs> zombie fish. Have, like, I feed the deer in my neighborhood, like, on a daily basis. And the idea of them trying to, like, snatch my fingers is horrifying. Like, having them be so, a zombie. So, uh, what neighborhood do you live in, bro? <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm pretty sure if, if, if it's within San Antonio limits, you can't have live fire hunting. <laughs> we, <laughs> we've had the game where... We right. have the game warden come by like once a month and like interrogating everybody. Be like, who's who's the one taking shots at the deer here? What the hell's wrong with the Oh people? my god. Right. <laughs> well, I mean, the humane method would be um, pitfall traps, right? You know, lined with stakes. Oh, yeah. Like a punji pit? <laughs> yeah. Now, you're not gonna yeah have, there you go. <laughs> you're not going to have any like off target effects, right? You put little signs up saying, you know, sharpen bamboo stakes, please don't enter. Yeah, I gotta warn my Amazon delivery guy to not step over here. That's right. <laughs> Don't leave packages on the rattan matting with the pile of deer food in the middle. <laughs> anyway, I've learned a lot about you, Paul, over the course of this this semester. <laughs> I mean, I'm an open book. What can I say? Right. Um, anyway, uh, that's kind of it from me. So, uh, for those that are present, it's been a, well, actually for everybody, obviously it's been a super awesome semester. I've had an absolute whale of a time and I'd, I'd probably say that this has been my most favorite course that I've taught, uh, here at San Antonio without, without a doubt.
Awesome. Thanks. I appreciate you too. It's been a great yeah. class. It was, it was a lot of fun. Uh, hopefully the, the final won't uh, change your opinion. <laughs> <laughs> too easy. Oh, uh, I'll try not That's to not a challenge, it. by the way. Not a challenge. <laughs> right. I'm like, what? <laughs> Yeah, yeah, you, you, you're you're in everybody's good books for the the quiz partial credit, Jimmy. Don't don't go changing that back again. Yes, sir. <laughs> or not again, obviously. But um, uh, Robertson, I'm pretty sure I won't be teaching developmental biology for until 2022. I think is the the next scheduled time I'm teaching that. So. I'm pretty much teaching genetics from here to eternity. This class is a, a, a rare um, exception. Uh, this is pretty much, actually most likely this will be the only time this course is ever taught in San Antonio, Texas A&M San Antonio. So you are a very select group of students. Class of 2020. There you go. Um, yeah, and that was just because I couldn't teach developmental biology because of other issues. So I ended up teaching astrobiology instead. I'm glad it happened. Yeah, me too. It's been uh, super fun. Absolutely. Been really, a good old really time. Yeah. Learn a, learn a lot of physics in the process. <laughs> Is there a, any update on the ceremony that was postponed to September? For graduates? Uh, not that I'm aware of, no. Um, I did get an email from the provost a little while ago saying that you will still graduate uh, in the sense that you'll get your degree, um, but the plans to actually be able to walk the stage to physically get given a piece of paper by someone um, are still uncertain right now. Right. So I, I don't actually know, I'm sorry. Um, most likely, as soon as I know, you would, you would know as well. It's not something we we found find out kind of a long time ahead of students. Typically, it would only be a day or two at most. Right. Yeah. So I, I was just know. curious. Mm -hmm. Family keeps bugging me, and I'm like, I just want my diploma or my degree yeah. in the mail. So. Yeah. Well, you <laughs> yeah, just mail it to me. Yeah, you'll still get that. That's for sure. It's not going to change your graduation plans. Uh, it just might change your your ability of your family to come and watch you graduate. Essentially, I mean, if you want, just like take a little video of you open up the the <laughs> the folder that you get in the post and say, "Here you go, graduated." Um, yeah, I don't even know if there are going to be classes in the fall. To be honest, in person, I don't know how long the the online teaching is going to go. I know it's over the summer. Uh, for definite it's still online only um, but I don't know about the the fall presumably well, well they'll let us know when they let us know great so, thank yeah. you and it was a pleasure having you as a professor uh, for two semesters now so yeah yeah it's been a lot of fun Pedro that's for sure thank you all right ladies and gents sayonara uh any questions let me know before friday morning and if you have any issues with taking the exam as well on friday also let me know it's possible to to change us i will robert and very much so um yeah you can get off is is the final scheduled from nine to ten or whatever nine to midnight or is it like nine to midnight so you got all day you got all day, but um, so, it's timed. Like once you start it, you've got an hour, but like I've got all, I don't need to wake up at 8.30 in the morning to get no. ready to take it at nine. Oh, Just well. for you, Paul. There you go. Appreciate it. What a, what a, <laughs> what a magnanimous leader you are. Right. <laughs> yeah, just don't, don't start at like 10, 10 to midnight because you'll, you'll get it auto-submitted on midnight. That's the only thing. Don't leave it too late. Um, and also, I'll be uh, on Zoom on Friday morning at 9. So if anyone does have any problems with the exam or clarifications or anything like that, then uh, I'll be around to, 
kind of feel those concerns or questions. But you don't have to take it during that period. Just if you wish to, you can. Cool. All right, I'm going to go make myself a coffee, get started on some other fun stuff. See you all. Have a good day. Bye. Um, and have a good if I don't one. See you. See you later. I probably won't. Have a lovely summer. Bye, sir. <laughs> you as well. Have a good summer. See you.